Well, hi everybody. Hey, it's nice to be back. As uh, as you've heard, I I got to spend summer in Arizona last year. It was wonderful, <laughs> just wonderful. You know, have you ever been to Arizona? Oh yeah. So then you know, in Michigan. We have snow, and you park as close as you can to the store. In Arizona, we have summertime, and you park within three miles if it's in the shade and walk. I kid you not. I kid you not. So we're out there, and and uh, a newscaster comes on, and well, this is actually before we left last year. So this is like May, April, May. She says, oh, it's going to be a hot one today. We're, we're reaching the mid, mid to upper 90s. She's new. And one of the newscasters says, uh, Kim, uh, we don't call mid to upper 90s hot. It's not summertime. So, okay. So, we call hot. Today's high will be about 117 with a low around 70, perhaps 80 degrees overnight. The next day, high of 117 today, third day, high of 117 today, fourth day, high of 115 today, it's cooling off a little bit. <laughs> but it's a dry heat, and so is a microwave. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to be back here and see some, some familiar faces and to be back here at the Coptic Center. And, Tonight I want to talk to you about anticipation. I've got some thoughts I'd like to share with you. Well, Merriam-Webster, to begin, defines anticipation as a feeling of excitement about something that's going to happen. It's the act of preparing for something. And anticipation is different from expectations. A guy walks into a bar. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, six words, I said. <laughs> a guy walks into a bar. Six words, and you're smiling, and Pete's groaning already. <laughs> Stop me if you know this one, Pete. Oh, a guy walks into a bar. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> six little words. What about these six words? You know what your problem is? Okay. You know what your problem is? Oh, yeah. Six words. Yeah. Nobody's <laughs> laughing. I heard some groans. <laughs> what was the difference? Six words here, six words there. One, you're anticipating. You've made that quantum leap with just those six little words. You've made that quantum leap that, oh, I'm about to hear something funny, I hope. Knowing Andy, I'm probably going to groan. <laughs> six words. You anticipated something good is going to happen. You were getting set up for it. Your entire attitude changed. Six little words. You know what your problem is? You weren't anticipating. You were expecting. Because your past experience has taught you that when somebody says those six little words, you know what your problem is? It's probably not going to be happy time. That's experience. That's expectations. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Meanwhile, hang on. Anticipate. So six words said twice, different words, but you had a completely different reaction because you anticipated one and you had expectations for the other. Was it what I said? Was it my body language? The, the, the tone of my voice? 
Expectations are usually based on past experience, and there is a fine difference between anticipation and expectation. Uh, here's a quote that might help explain this a little bit from A. A. Milne, the author of the Winnie the Pooh books. And he says, well, said Pooh, what I like best, and then he had to stop and think, because although eating honey was a very, very good thing to do, there was a moment, a moment just before you began to eat it, which was better than when you were but he didn't know what it was called. I think it's called the anticipation. The hope of what is about to come. Sometimes anticipation is better than the actual experience. Wait till you hear the end of my joke. <laughs> what matters is the emotion, the hope, the looking forward to, the excitement. Anything can happen. Anything is possible. So what's the difference between anticipation and expectations? The difference is in our attitude. What is hope? And that's anticipation. Hope allows for any number of things to happen. Hope keeps us open to the possibilities we couldn't even imagine. Hope keeps us moving on. Hope is anticipation. And anticipation is excitement. So when I was a kid, I was born and raised in a little town in, in New Jersey. And in the, the large town near us, there was a store called Salney Brothers. And it was kind of like, it was kind of like a Robert Hall, and that they carried men's clothing only. And they also had Boy Scout uniforms there, which my brother, that's where my younger brother got his scout uniform. But you could join the kids' birthday club at Selmy Brothers. And every year they would send you a gift on your birthday. And let me tell you, it was oh, months of anticipation. 11 months and 29 days of anticipation, <laughs> to be exact. It was never a big gift, but every year around my birthday week, I would run home from school and pull open a mailbox to see if my gift from Salney Brothers came. Oh, I tell you, it was just wonderful. Somebody knew me, somebody cared about me, somebody loved me. And I anticipated that gift. It, like I say, it was never a big one, but it was always the hope. It was always the anticipation. It was always the looking forward to this. My favorite, the one I remember most, came running home from school and ran up to the mailbox and yanked it open and reached inside and sure enough, there was an envelope addressed to me from Saudi Brothers. My birthday gift had arrived. I could hardly wait. I ran in the house and up to my room and I tore it open and I pulled out a six inch comb that had its own protector. Oh, this is good. It wasn't a big deal. It was never a big gift, but the anticipation of getting something, ah, that was worth every moment of it. So, what's the difference? It's in our attitude, in and about town, I've covered that, let me go over here to the other page. Yes, a six inch comb in its own little carrying case. What a neat gift that was. Expectation, I still smile at the memory, if you can tell, it's, it just warms my heart. Expectation is different, however, and it usually has a very specific outcome when we begin to expect things. And it's usually almost always based on our past experiences and concerns a third party. 
I've been working hard. I've been extremely productive. I expect to get that raise. Expectation comes with preconceived notions that almost always involve other people. Having expectations is the kind of thinking that will leave you in constant turmoil because you possibly, you cannot possibly plan out what or how other people will act or what they may do. Expectation leaves an opening for us not to accept responsibilities. It makes it very easy for us to blame other people. That's a victim mentality and it doesn't serve anyone well. Expectations take away the opportunity for other people to do what they want. In Arizona, I had some car work done, so I brought it into the dealer, explained the problem. Oh yeah, we can, we can have that fixed for you in no time. A reputable dealer, relatively new car, a minor irritating problem. I expected it to be fixed rather quickly. Shall I wait for it? Oh, no, we'll give you a call. Okay. Well, what do I do? Well, we're going to rent you a car because it's probably going to be overnight. Overnight turned into, well, we wouldn't have it ready until probably Monday. And that turned into, well, on Friday, we will call you and let you know where we stand with the part that we've had to order to fix this little situation here. Meanwhile, my expectations were that uh, I'd sit in the waiting room, I'd read a couple of magazines, catch up on a little reading or what have you know, and it's turned into like 10 days they've got my car. And, and my expectations certainly were not met. Eventually it did get solved, however, and I'm pretty happy with the work that they did. And I anticipate going there next time I have a vehicle problem, but I will not go there with the expectation of waiting for it. I can tell you that. <laughs> expectation and anticipation. Over the Memorial Day weekend, we were blessed to have our family and come with, stay with us, some of our family anyhow. We had three grandchildren and two of their friends came down along with their families. And, we had quite a household full. And my wife and I, Linda, we live in Sandy Pines. If you're familiar with Sandy Pines, it's a golf court community. And uh, so the boys are there and, and uh, they take off on the golf cart and they get there, they, they hug us hello and, and then we'll see at dinner time type of thing. You know, they just, they're off. It is a teenage haven. These, Sandy Pines is a wonderful place if you're an adult, if you're a senior citizen, it's great. But if you're a teen, you have found heaven on earth. So anyhow, the boys are out and they're out roaming around on the golf cart. Who knows where the dickens they are, but everybody nowadays has a cell phone, so we're not concerned about them. And they are responsible kids. Well, that afternoon, they came rip-roaring into the driveway, slamming on the brakes, stones went flying everywhere, came running out, Gramps, do you have a rake and a shovel? Yeah, <laughs> I believe me, I do. I've got a wheelbarrow and what's going on? Well, this woman is next street over, she saw us roaming around and she said, wow, we have a lot of, I have a lot of cleaning up that needs to be done here in my yard and, and I'll give you all, all $30 if you'll clean it up for me. Said, oh, great, good for you guys. And so they piled back on the golf cart with my rakes and my shovels and, and whatnot, and they took off. And about an hour later, they came back, sweaty and dirty. Mission accomplished. As well, the spokesperson, happened to be my second youngest grandson, Carter, came up and said, uh, well, we're done, Gramps. I said, good. I said, where, who was this woman? Oh, they call her pop-up Mary, and it so happens Mary lives on the street behind us. And she's an elderly woman, and, and a lot of pine trees, and a lot of pine cones and leaves, I'm sure. And so they made quick work of it. And I said, well, Carter, I said, what are you guys going to do with that money? He says, well, she gave us $30. There's five boys. She, she gave us $30 and told us to go get some pizza. And I said, well, do you go get pizza or what? She said, and Carter said, no, nah, Gramps, we, we put the money in her golf cart cup holder and we figured 
she probably needed it more than we needed pizza. So I, I hope I have not seen Mary since then, but I hope she found that $30. As a matter of fact, I went back to look for it, it was gone. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But there, there's an expectation. Mary had the expectation of you clean my yard up and I will pay you money. That's, that's the exchange that we get. And the boys went over there, perhaps with the expectation of we can clean our yard up and make pizza money, or perhaps the anticipation of here I can do something for someone else. I like to think it's the latter. Expectation and qualifications. If this, then that. You do this for me and I'll do that for you. In our growing up years, and I'm sure I can speak for everyone, we learned about if this, then that, and expectations and qualifications. Do these words ring a bell with you? Uh -huh. Perhaps you've heard them more often than not. And in, in my case, I, that's true. And in my case, it's also true that I've said them more often than not. Uh -huh. I expect this room to be cleaned by the time I get back from shopping, grocery, no. cleaning back, whatever. I expect this room to be cleaned or else. It's every parent's go-to to get something done. It's an expectation, and it involves a third party. In this case, my grand, my children, and perhaps your children as well. And so we get back, and the room's not cleaned. Now what? Well, there will be no Atari games for you. My kids are grown. No Atari games for you for the rest of the week. <laughs> So I was really, I was kind of forced into uh, coming up with a qualification. The qualifications and expectations kind of reminds me of the story of this newlywed couple. And you see, expectations come from our experiences, and, and I grew up hearing those words. You know, I expect this to be done by the time I get back, or else. And in that case, when I was growing up, or else meant you weren't going to sit down for a long time. <laughs> and, and, and so we all have this, we've learned expectations from our youth, from our growing up, from our environment. And so did this newlywed couple. And on their honeymoon, the husband got up, went into the coffee, and went into the kitchen to pour himself a cup of coffee, and it was not made. And the wife came in, and, and he said to her, he said, well, honey, he says, I'm, I thought you'd make coffee. And she said, well, it's not my job. Why would you, why on earth would you expect me to do something like that? Well, in my household, mom always got up early and made coffee. And she said, well, that's just not the way that it is. Even the Bible says that's not the way that it is. Um, he says, you stop me if you've heard this. <laughs> he says, well, what do you mean the Bible says? And she goes over and she pulls the Bible out and she points, opens it up and points right here. It says Hebrews. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're on tape. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know some of you have heard me speak of my, my wife's cousin, Gordy. Uh, and in case you don't remember or you haven't heard this story, let me share this with you again, because this is a prime example of, of attitude and anticipation. Gordy was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, and it was terminal. And the doctors did not expect him to live beyond six months. It was bad, real bad. Go home and get your house in order, Gordon. Well, several years later, Linda and I are in Lansing visiting with Gordy. And Gordy said, Linda had asked him, well, Gordy, what do you attribute your longevity to? Having been given the maximum of six months left to live, what have you done? And how did, how did this happen? And Gordy said, I have a philosophy that you need three things in life. You need someone to love, and I love my wife. 
You need someone to love you. And my wife and my family love me. And the third thing is you need something to look forward to. Now, Gordy retired from the financial community after 40 years of being an extremely successful agent. And he took up photography. And Gordy's one of those kind of guys that no matter what he does, he's going to be a great success at. He was a massively successful photographer. He would travel around the world doing photographs and selling them. He was just excellent. And so he would order all this photography equipment online. So he had something to look forward to. Something to anticipate. Anticipation. Hope. Excitement? Will it help you live longer? I don't know. But why not give it a try, right? <laughs> Anticipation requires work, too. You must prepare for what you're anticipating, readying the playing field. Now, several years ago, I was invited to attend a, a silent retreat. Have you ever done a silent retreat? Well, this was my first time ever, and it was up in southern Wisconsin at a, uh, at a monastery. And I was invited by a friend. So I went up there, and we, we go into this chapel, if you will. It's dead silent. There's a few people whispering back and forth, perhaps, and then the brother gets up in the front, and he says a few prayers and gives us instructions and he says and when the bells chime we go into silence and we'll be in silence for the next 72 hours until the bells chime so he gave us instructions and he told us what was expected now, mind you, I've never done anything like this, so I didn't know what the Dickens to anticipate, but I am so geeked. I'm going to go up there. I am going to, I'm going to become a brother. They're going to invite me to join their monastery because they're going to see suddenly this halo lights up. And Andy Tomko is next in line for sainthood. I am going to become enlightened. I am going to get to know myself better. My meditations will be so wonderful, people will clamor to my doorstep for instructions. Do you know how long 72 hours is? Without a word? Like three times a day, you go into the chapel. And a brother gets up and he says, your instructions for this afternoon's meditation are this, blah, 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 blah. Thank you. And he walks away and you're in silence and you're all alone. And it's cool going through the cafeteria. You, know, you just point at stuff, you know, and no, I didn't really want that but it's on your plate and you ate what you were given. 72 hours, my goodness, that's a very, very, very long time. So let me tell you, at the end of the 72 hours and the bell is chimed like that and I walked out of there and I don't sing, I've been banned from singing in four provinces and 50 country, 50 states, honest to God, I have. They do not allow me to sing. I was talking out loud, I'm singing on the radio, anything to hear a human voice. <laughs> 72 hours. Well, I didn't get nominated for sainthood, I'll tell you that. It was a neat experience. It was a neat experience. Would I do it again? No. No, I won't do it again. But it was my own fault because I went there with the expectation of becoming enlightened. I expected somebody else, I expected that brother up there in the pulpit to tell me exactly what to do, say these magic words, and thou shalt become. I expected this. It was somebody else's fault it didn't happen. It wasn't my fault. Had I gone there with the idea of anticipating becoming enlightened? 
if I had planned on this. You see, in nautical terms, I put the ship in the ocean, but I didn't set the rudder. I didn't have a plan. It didn't happen for me because I was expecting instead of anticipating. And so I started anticipating things. And here's what happened to me. And here's what I hope will happen to you should you choose to begin anticipating rather than expecting. It used to be I get up 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, I'd put the coffee on to brew, I'd go over and I'd sit in my little, my little cozy chair in my, in my little sacred space, and I'd close my eyes, and I'd fold my hands, and I'd listen to my breath, and I would meditate for a long, long time. And I'd open my eyes, and three minutes had passed. <laughs> yeah, well, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? This is not what I expected to happen. Change my expectations to <laughs> anticipations. Whatever happens, happens. So I get up in the morning, I put the coffee on, I go over to my chair over in the little corner there, and I sit down and I cross my legs and I fold my arms and I close my eyes and I follow my breath in and out, in and out, and in and out. And I open my eyes and 15 minutes have gone by. Cool. Other times I open my eyes and it's been an hour. Really cool. Sometimes I, I go into meditation and I'm in the light. I can feel the presence of the light. I can feel the warmth. I can feel the radiance. Super cool. Sometimes I go into meditation and I hear my neighbor's dog. Hey, what happens, happens. I have no set agenda because I am anticipating that good things will come to me. I am anticipating whatever happens to me is going to be for my highest and my best good. <coughs> Hope springs eternal. Hope keeps us alive. Hope is why we get back up after we fall. Hope is anticipation, and anticipation is the smile on your face. Anticipation is a feeling, and it's a good feeling. It's joy and happiness and surprises all rolled into one. Do you ever see a kid at Christmas time? Or a kid? right around his birthday week, anticipating that package to arrive from Sally Brothers. Oh man, they are geeked. You can't sit them down, you can't keep them still because they are excited. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what Santa Claus is going to bring them. But they are filled with anticipation, with this excitement. What would happen if you brought that excitement, that anticipation into your life and became as a child. Jesus tells us that to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become as little children. Plan for what you want. Do your due diligence for what you want. You want better financials? Do your due diligence. You want a better marriage? Do your due diligence. Do research. Whatever it is that you want in your life, research it. Do your due diligence. Find out how other people have been successful and then put that plan into action and anticipate success at the end. If it comes to you and it's massive success, great. 
And if it's a little of success, super. And if it somehow entirely misses you, go back and start all over. Remember, the universe is a cornucopia of abundance. It, whatever it is for you, is there waiting for you. Anticipate it. Plan on it. Decide what needs to be done to get it, and then look forward to receiving it. Not too long ago, Mike Dooley, you all know Mike Dooley? Owner of the, well, owner. He writes notes from the universe. If you don't know of Mike Dooley, I suggest when you go home tonight, Google him, sign up for his newsletter, sign up for notes from the universe. You will not be disappointed. So Mike Dooley, creator of Notes from the Universe, sent re me this reminder via email, and he said, Andy, do not think that you have to get there, whoever there is for you, with what you have today, whether in terms of money, confidence, talent, connections, whatever. Bad idea. Doesn't work that way. Too scary. Once you set yourself in motion, the necessary resources in terms of money, confidence, talent, connections will be drawn to you. Soft whisper in the background. Once you set yourself in motion, fade out the universe. To me, that note spoke of anticipation. To think about, think about now, you're Anticipating I'm done. <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard enough. And so, not to disappoint you. <laughs> Come on. Remember those six words I spoke to you at the, at the beginning, at the top? You know what your problem is? Well, let me tell you what your problem is. Your problem is exactly nothing because you are perfect. You are a child of the perfect universe. You are a spirit embodied. You are at all times doing the best you can with what you have, doing the most with the knowledge that you have at any given moment. There is nothing wrong with you. <coughs> and if you screw up, it's a learning lesson. Uh, cool. Oh, so this guy walks into a bar. <laughs> guy walks into a bar and he says to the bartender, he says, ah, he says, give me four draft beers. So the bartender pours out four draft beers and the guy takes a sip out of this one, a sip here and a sip there and a sip there until they're all gone. Bartender kind of looks at him and says, well, Anything else I can get you? And they, no, no. He says, thank you very much. And he walks out of the bar. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, the guy comes walking back in. He says, ah, he says, pour me four draft beers. Bartender pours four draft beers. Sip out of this one and this one and this one and this one. Until they're all gone. Bartender gets up the curb. He says, listen, Mac. He says, obviously. He says, you've been in here before. He says, you must be celebrating something. You always get four draft beers and drink them all down. What, what, what is it? Oh, he says, it's not a celebration at all. He says, I've got three other brothers, and we all live far apart from each other. So we decided whenever we go to a bar, we're going to have a drink for the other brother. <laughs> oh, says the bartender. That's pretty cool. A couple of weeks go by. Same guy walks into a bar. Bartender sees him come and starts pouring out four drafts. And the guy goes, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, only three this time. Whoa. 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 Well, obviously something happened, said the bartender. I've, did, you, did you lose a brother? I'm, my, my condolences. Nah, he says, I didn't lose a brother. They're still alive. I, I just got married. My wife doesn't want me drinking anymore. <laughs> Oh, come on, it wasn't that bad. Oh, you guys are tough. That's terrible, man. So much for my expectation of uproarious laughter and people having to go to the bathroom. And... 
<laughs> well, I'd like to leave you with these final words. We can never know about the days to come, but we think about them anyway. And I wonder if I'm really with you now or just chasing after some finer day. Anticipation. Anticipation. It's keeping me waiting. It's making me late. I anticipate being here with you again in the near future at the Coptic Center. I anticipate having better jokes for you. Me too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, and may God's blessings be with each and every one of us. Have a great week. Yeah.